nothing happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop, children What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Being wrong And nobody's right If everybody's wrong Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance From behind the time we stopped Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Field day for the heat. A thousand people in the street singing songs and they carry inside. Mostly say hooray for our side. It's time we stop. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on.
inside the film. Imagine me and you, I do. I think about you day and night. It's only right to think about the girl you love and hold her tight. So happy together. If I should call you up, invest a dime, and you say you belong to me, and lose my mind. Imagine how the world could be so very fun, so happy together. Just most honored that uh, the two of them uh, conspired to uh, allow me to be, uh, first of all, honored that there's so many of you here. I've counted 150, it was an estimate. Uh, but, uh, but, but mostly uh, uh, to be up here with this august uh, group of uh, folks, I'm really pleased to uh, be with you all here. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm also really honored that uh, my, uh, my spouse of we're in our 49th year together. Robin Bagley. Robin Bagley, where'd she get stuck? Uh, and her son, John Bagby. <laughs> who, who's uh, filming somewhere. Uh, stand up, John. His, his name's Jack, so, you know, it's too confusing. John, and then everybody comes. What, what's that all about? Um, so, uh, John is ABD at uh, Boston College. Uh, he's uh, working on his dissertation. Uh, it uh, was Spinoza, and it's now who? Aristotle. Oh, okay, Aristotle. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, so, it turns out BC's a really good school. It's a Jesuit school. Who knew? <laughs> Now, what I mean by that is, uh, my mom was a uh, Second World War bride from Belfast, and uh, she is and was to today a, a Northern Irish Protestant. So, uh, Jesuit school being really cool, it's like, I never knew that until now, and I'm really proud that he's uh, there. Thanks for coming, and uh, he'll be posting all of the other night's bad videos. Uh, I. Uh, uh, slide 13 here that I don't get to show you because the slides didn't work out. And, and Bob says, oh, friends don't let friends use PowerPoint. 
<laughs> My life has been PowerPoint. What do you mean I can't use PowerPoint? Uh, and then I said, I thought it was drive drunk. Uh, or drink Starbucks. And uh, actually, I did have a couple Starbucks this morning. Uh, but not uh, any Red Bulls, I swear, Norm. Where's Norm? He had to leave. Norman! <laughs> he, was, he, he was driving back to Fort Worth. I, I think he just stepped out for the first 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so uh, my, my last slide is my life's work, and I guess I'm not going to bother with that. Um, <laughs> instead, uh, you know, I uh, spent 39 years in the professorate and uh, went to KU. Rock chalk. <laughs> KU. Hit it! I had a, a couple short stints in practice. Uh, one of the points I'm be making is that I got a lot of breaks along the way, a lot of mentors and helpers, and Steve James, dad from Skelly, got me the interview when I was down at law school in Tulsa. And oh my gosh, being a, a corporate uh, lawyer, uh, even as a third year, uh, very, very important. So I really always thank Chalmer. He was just uh, a prince of a guy to uh, uh, get me that uh, help. Help, I got me that gig. Uh, <laughs> but one door opens, another one slams shut on your rear. And so uh, that's really my thesis that I was trying to make. And uh, uh, Bob kind of uh, cut out some of the details. So Bob, here's what I wanted to say. The a proverbial life well planned. Uh, and we know that's from some Raymond James or some tagline on their ad. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm looking at uh, the life that I had. And you know, uh, I had... Uh, uh, some goals and uh, you know a path to get there and you know it didn't quite work out it was circuitous but the other thing I got and it started here and back at Meadowbrook which is now an old folks home <laughs> and it started back at Somerset which is a slightly nicer uh, old folks home so Robin uh, we can go there uh, yeah. we're out in central Missouri and we live in the barn and you know, people used to say to me, what were you born in a barn? And I said, no, but I live in one. <laughs> uh, but the other thing to do uh, is to uh, get a diverse set of uh, uh, cool skill sets and uh, uh, for the throngs of SME seniors that I was expecting to be here. For the throngs of... For the throngs of SME current faculty who are here, <laughs> Sue, is Sue Jackson around? She's not no, coming. She's not coming. Uh, Sue, Sue, uh, Rick Kaplan's been a, a, a faculty here. Yeah, used to be. Okay, it's not coming out of my 15 minutes. Do I still have about six? Okay. Slide number two. All right, so there's this thing. If you go on rapeyourprofessor.com, you'll find out that, yes, indeed, death by PowerPoint. I, I did not invent it. No, no, I just refined it. So my thesis is, uh, you know, if you do these two things, plan your life and have a bunch of good skills, then uh, you can fall back on one or, or John with the other one, and a door slams shut, and maybe a, a nice one opens up. But I was really helped a lot by family and friends and great colleagues all along the way. And that's the mentoring that I think everybody in this room could be doing. It's just hard to hook up mentees or protégés. They protégés kind of demeaning, so I like mentees and mentors. Kind of hard to hook them up. Um, you know, I'm. Did, did it my whole life, and I uh, got a whole lot of grad students and uh, JDs and, and undergrads who uh, still send me Christmas cards and stuff, I can't believe. Uh, you, you know, uh, Rob and I went through uh, all the old Hauberks. Who, who here was on Hauberk staff? Not me. Ooh, yeah. Hauberkers, come on. So, uh, excellent work, uh, and uh, you know, still stands up pretty good. Uh, Looked at all my old teachers who I thought, oh, this one made a difference, that one made a difference. And what I was surprised to find is that most of them were coaches and STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. 
And then what did I go into law? And what is law? I, okay, okay, just try to not. Um, it's kind of a humanity, it's kind of a social science. Oh, Jack Bagby, don't you have an attitude about that? That was his one chance. Uh, why wasn't it that uh, uh, all the uh, social science and uh, humanities uh, teachers here didn't end up being the main ones? And I think my thesis again is, Rick, that, he's falling asleep over here, <laughs> that I had a diverse bunch of different influences and they come in handy along the way even though I found my own path in a different way. And having all these great people doing mentoring, all of you could do mentoring if we could just figure out uh, what kind of a, a mentoring, uh, interactive, uh, 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 sort of a dating site uh, that would uh, happen. Um, all right, Jack Baggy, one last time. Uh, so, uh, getting on the stage with Spring Fever and uh, uh, Mixed Ensemble, uh, not quite making a double quartet. I was number nine. Uh, uh, the uh, Mikado. Uh, the Mikado, okay, thank you so uh, I, You know, I then moving into large session classes at Penn State where sometimes we filled an auditorium and uh, it was just PowerPoints and they, they wouldn't let me have a little laser pointer. It was the size of a uh, relay baton. I guess they, they wanted to use D-cells or they thought I was going to rip it off. I don't know. Uh, but that was so uh, big section classes. No essays. Used to sit there with a pile of blue books I went for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And, hours. and here's this pile of blue books left to grade. Uh, we went to multiple choice. <laughs> <laughs> Worked really well, and except when you have a bad question, and then whoa, then the grade grubbers just start knocking you down. Uh, so I, I, I have to say, my mom got me in here the very first time. It was us. Uh, summer after eighth grade, you were taking typing, you're not lying around the house doing nothing. Uh, and I was still a little pudgy then, I was trying to uh, work off some of that baby fat. And uh, she thought that, <laughs> starting with my fingers. Uh, well, I ended up using the typing uh, my whole life, hardly had any papers typed by secretaries, it was almost all my own. Uh, so uh, my advice to all you uh, SME uh, students is uh, plan your work and work your plan. Uh, Uncle Julian, the uh, Pepsi bottler and mayor of Sedalia and uh, oil man and Democratic Party operative, took me to the 68 convention. That was really a what? Uh, the whole world is watching. Remember that? Uh, but you got to do critical thinking. Uh, and that is really important at a top 100 research university. Uh, you need to diversify your skill set. That's a cool thing. Advice to SME faculty. Okay, one more after this, I swear I'll be okay. <laughs> uh, please send us your best. Please. Basic skills are most prized, notwithstanding the current admission standard. <laughs> which uh, just unfolds in really cool ways almost every day. I say cool because I love problems that I can write up and get published and you know, so for me it's like that. Sure, the ACT and the SAT are real important proficiency exams and teaching to them is what you have, the parents are forcing you to do, but you know what? <laughs> the, the test isn't perfect. It doesn't always test the stuff that we need. Uh, so anyway, do some other stuff and that maybe that's uh, 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 piling up on your resume with some uh, outside activities, uh, I, I don't know. And, and my last uh, horse I've been riding here lately is online coursework has very significant limitations. And the champions of it will be the last people to tell you there's any flaws in online education. Uh, there's a host of societal and university budget reasons why we're going to get much more of it, uh, but let's just be real careful with it. Finally, advice to SME 69ers. Mentor, mentor, mentor. <laughs> Sadly, there are barriers to uh, uh, mentoring, uh, and uh, so keep physically and mentally active and mentor while exercising. <laughs> Here's something, let me tell you something. Now, when back in my day, travel, hobbies are great. I'm finding woodworking again. 
Mr. Baldwin, seventh grade. He, it, was, it was fabulous. Uh, travel. Uh, so we had the cord cut for 39 months, just got dished last month, and it, what a difference in life that has been. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to talk about privacy and uh, how that's uh, still a horse I'm riding. My cryptocurrency blockchain article's coming out in the UMKC Law Review this month. And uh, anyway, thanks a lot for letting me in. <laughs> The last two nights at Brewbaker's and at the Jazz House, our number one word we kept saying to one another was, what? Because it was so loud. I just wanted to say that to Bagby. What? What? That's what I want to do. <laughs> we may, if you continue to behave very well. <laughs> we may have time for questions back up here. Mary Pat, where are you? Right here. I see you. I'm not following Batting. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Batting second from California, you number 14. Can I, can I do, Bob, would Mary you mind bringing me that tall chair so I don't have to walk around? Somebody can bring her a tall chair. <laughs> Oh, sure, sure. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Mary Pat Green. Green. I'm old. I have to sit down. Uh, I can't walk around like this. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, this is my birthday month, so I don't talk about it. Anyway, uh, hi everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't tell anybody. Uh, this has been just the last night because I, I didn't get in until yesterday because I was shooting a movie on Thursday. Party. I think I have one line, so don't. don't uh, uh, I'll tell you what. It, it's a Netflix movie. It's called Blonde. It's about Marilyn Monroe. And uh, the young woman playing Marilyn Monroe is unbelievable. She looks just like the young Marilyn Monroe. Uh, uh, so it's, it'll be an interesting film. It's, uh, there's some nudity involved, so be careful. Because nope. <laughs> it's Netflix, and of course she was nude. So what's your line? But my, uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see, was that, that was day before yesterday. Um, I, I play one of her dressers or people in her room, her, her people, her wardrobe people, whatever. I don't remember the line. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I, what I thought I'd do is talk for like five minutes because most of you or a lot of you know what I do and what I've done. And then, and then maybe if you have questions, if you don't have any questions, then I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, so Mr. Evans and Mr. Farnsworth are who, who, who I am today because, I mean, I always wanted to do it. I wanted to do it from the fourth. Thank you so much. Does this have liquor in it? Um, <laughs> not yet. So, uh, I, I mean, I wanted to do. I wanted to be an actress from the fourth grade. My mother was the Girl Scout leader, and she did a play called The King's Cream Puffs, and I got to play the king. <laughs> the best part was I got to eat cream puffs the entire play. So I thought, oh, the act, this acting thing's pretty good. You get to like eat the good stuff. Anyway, so so that began it, and then of course Indian Hills Junior High, and and uh, and then coming here with Mr. Farnsworth and Mr. Uh, Evans um, it just made me know even more so that that's what I wanted to do. Now I will say that Priscilla pulled a uh, harbinger from uh, uh, from November 17, 1967, and you can't take it with you, which is the first play I did here. I am not listed in the cast, nor am I in the picture. <laughs> so, thank you, Priscilla. <laughs> I thought that my name's got to be here somewhere. But no, it's all right. Um, so I learned a lot from them, and uh, and I knew that I didn't want to go to college for a long time. So I, when we graduated, I went to KU. I went for two years. I took every acting class, every singing class, every class that had something to do with what I wanted to do. And then I told my parents, and now I'm going to go to New York. And I was one of the luckiest people because my parents were so for that. And, and I know there's a lot of kids, and, and, and maybe some of you too, whose, whose parents didn't like the, the road you wanted to take. 
and and they were totally behind. <laughs> yeah, okay. Are oh, you can't you can't hear me? <laughs> Shall I use the megaphone that about you? All right, you can't hear me. I'm sorry. I'll speak up. I'm used to be in the theater. Um, <laughs> anyway, I said, Mr. Evans and Mr. Farnsworth are who I am today. They made me who I am today. And uh, as, as well as, as teachers at, at KU. So I went there for two years, did everything I could do, every show I could do, and then I left for New York. I am, everybody should touch me before they leave because I am the luckiest person on the, on the planet. I got to New York, I was there for six weeks, and I auditioned for the national bus and, bus and truck of Godspell. And I got the job, and I got in the union, and I had a paying job for a year, and I was like, oh, well, this is easy. <laughs> and, and, uh, and did that for a year, incredible education, and Sandal can tell you that from tours and things. You, you're in a different venue every night or every other night on a bus and truck, and then you're on the bus for eight hours. And it's a good thing I was only like 20 or 21, because I would have died about this age. Um, but that was an incredible education, and then from there I went back to New York, and again, incredibly lucky. I had been home for a week and there were auditions for the Broadway revival of Candide, which uh, Harold Prince was directing. And I went to the interview and then I got a call back and I got a Broadway show one week coming back to New York. So in, in the right place at the right time, but also incredibly, incredibly lucky. So that was the first Broadway show I did and that lasted, I think, a year and a half. Maybe, maybe almost two. Then there was a musician strike and the damn musicians. Who's a musician in this room? <laughs> yeah, great, great. You struck in New York and our show closed and then we couldn't open back up because the audiences were gone for that show. So, that's but the that's, producers. That's the producers, well, yeah. That's well, their fault. Well, oh, that's their fault? Okay, all right, that's all right. It's a long time ago, I don't, I don't know. Uh, that was fine, then I, I um, then I had uh, lots of years of not doing a lot, except for I opened an ice cream store. <laughs> not, not bad, I got to sit and eat ice cream, like all day long was fantastic. Uh, and that was a couple of years I did that. And then I auditioned for Sweeney Todd, the original Sweeney Todd, for Mr. Sondheim and Mr. Prince. And I got into that. So again, it, it, lucky in the right place at the right time. Talent. 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 Thank you, thank you. That's that's yeah. kind of you. Uh, but there are people who are much better than I. Um, but so so that so that was it for the Broadway stuff. And then you know I'd been in New York now for a long time. I was I was doing some cabaret work, doing that kind of stuff, which was a lot of fun. And then I said, you know, I think I'll I think I'll move to LA for a little while and see what's up out there. And so I did, again, incredibly lucky. They're at the sitcom time in the 90s. So since that's what I basically was, was a comedian, I was able to do a boatload of sitcoms. And, um, and, and now I have a mansion in Beverly Hills. No, I do. <laughs> uh, I have a, li a little tiny apartment in Sherman Oaks. It's lovely, I love it, it's fine. Uh, but it, it's just been a, an incredible journey because I mean, sitcoms are very much like theater because there's an audience. So you're playing to an audience. You're not just playing to a camera. So, so I just, again, in the right place at the right time when those kinds of things were happening. And then I started doing some episodics where I played a lot of killers. <laughs> a lot of murderers. I mean, you know, the woman stole my boyfriend. I had to shoot her in the back. <laughs> okay, right? Uh, <laughs> that was my favorite one. Um, uh, and, and then I really don't know what else to tell you, except that I love what I do. I know that doing shows here with some of you who are in this room was an incredible education. Working with Mr. Farnsworth and Mr. Evans, incredible education. I see Mr. Evans now and again when every time I come in, I pretty much call him up and we go have a hamburger because that's what he wants. So uh, if you know Mr. Evans, uh, call, call him and because and, and, he'd love to hear from anybody who, who knows him. It, his wife passed away uh, a while ago and uh, he, has, he certainly has children, but he'd love to hear from anybody who remembers him from, from this school. Questions? <laughs> oh, I have some. Lovely. Yes, sir. First of all, I thoroughly enjoyed as my kids grew up going, 
I know her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Miley Cyrus, uh, you had an episode in. Oh wait. No, it, no not in the Mon not in the Montana, whatever that was called, Montana, Hannah Montana. I get them all mixed up. And here's my question: It's for both of you. How has it changed? The, the role of women and the difficulty, or maybe not difficulty, of being in your industry. How have you seen that mature or become less mature? Well, as a character woman, I... Would you I, repeat the question? Yes, the question was, how, how are women doing in the industry, basically? The what, obstacles. The, have we noticed the change, that there are more or less? I will tell you that older women on television, not so much because they just still don't quite believe there are older women in, in life. Uh, 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 they all had mothers, but they don't remember that. Uh, but, but I will say that uh, being a character woman, I think I've had a longer television life because of that. Because, uh, but, I, but I don't know that, you know, who knows? I mean, I haven't actually done a lot of TV recently. I did a show at the Geffen Theater in Los Angeles called Lights Out which we're hoping will go to Broadway about Nat King Cole, fantastic musical, starring Dulé Hill from West Wing, yeah. Oh, yeah. who was a musical performer before he became a, an actor, a TV actor, wonderful guy, and he was fantastic as Nat King Cole. So if you see Lights Out on Broadway, know that I hopefully am in it. <laughs> Sometimes they go, well, we liked her in that, but we could have so-and-so, uh, which would be fine because it's a great show. But I think that, uh, you know, if you're older and you're a star, if you're Kathy Bates or Sybil Shepherd or one of those people who are older women, those people get jobs, but not so much the older women like me, unless they want an assistant to Marilyn Monroe, who's new <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> yes? Great. More fun for you to have a steady role on a sitcom or a good role in a Broadway show that lasts a year? Much rather be in a Broadway show. I mean, sitcoms are, are fun to do. They're, I think they're hard. Don't you think they're hard, Sandal? Yeah, yeah I, I, they're hard to do, especially every week, every week, every week, every week. But they're not, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have a jackhammer. I'm not, you know, it's, it's not physically hard. Uh, for you, it's not physically hard because you were the fantastic dancer that you still are. Um, but uh, uh, I think that I love doing television because it's fun, especially funny television and especially playing murderers. Because, <laughs> because for some reason in real life you don't get to murder people. You know, that you, you might want to murder. Uh, so, so, th so, that, so both of them have been fun. So I do it, I, I enjoy all of the venue. I would, I would like to have a regular role on a series. I think that would be fantastic. Then I might have a mansion in Beverly Hills, which I don't. And so, but, but that's, that's sort of the, 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 the difference between the two, but I would, I started in theater, I would much rather be in New York doing shows all the time. Okay. Yeah. Retirement. Thank you. Casey. Retirement? What oh, about I'm it? I'm not going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> yes. Uh, in your career, who have you rubbed shoulders with uh, that we would know, stars we would know, and, and what, what kind of things do you remember? Uh, from Disney with him off camera. Ooh. What, that, what, that would happen off camera? You don't, don't tell those stories. You're trying to tell my, my whole life? No. Yeah, yes, they were always after me, those boys. <laughs> I, I mean, I've worked with so many fantastic people that I've tried to try. Angela Lansbury, for one, and Sweeney Todd, who is not only as fantastic of a performer as you all know she is, the kindest, sweetest. I mean, you know, she had a tea for all the women who were in the show and we all had a tea and she gave everybody a teacup from Cartier and, you know, it was, she's just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. And so that was, that was a terrific person to know. Um, Stephen Sondheim, genius. We all know that part. The same with Hal Prince, which I'm quite sad right now because he passed away about three or four weeks ago. That was hard for me because, <clears throat> okay, see, now you're going to make me cry. Uh, uh, I can do it on cue. What? <laughs> Al Prince, yeah. So, uh, because my mother was, uh, my dad was not as, as present as I would have liked him to be in my life. He had a stroke when he was not that old and I was not that old. So he wasn't, uh, wasn't present all the time, but he was there. 
but Hal Prince sort of became my dad, and uh, he was just wonderful to me as I was only 21 or two when I was doing Candide. He asked me to babysit his children, and so I'm, I'm still good friends with his kids, but he just was like a mentor to me, speaking of mentors earlier, and, um, and then when he put me in Sweeney Todd, that was just like the best thing ever, if you can imagine that. It's, um, so, so knowing a man like that, and, and Steve Sondheim, incredible man, and also very kind and sweet, but also not as per personable, because he's always, I think, he's always got something going on in his head that we all want to hear eventually, so, so he's not a, 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 as much a talker as, as Hal was. Um, I'm one, trying to think of famous more, like TV people. One more question. One more question, that's it, I'm done? That's, I'm sorry. Who would like to give me some of their time? No. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Mary Pat, I'd like to ask you a question. Rick Kaplan just showed me on his cell phone yes. your body of work in, in under IMDb. Yeah. I want to ask you, are you aware of how proud <laughs> all your classmates are of the work that you've done? <laughs> Priscilla, a quick question and then we'll finish. Well, um, since I was in Nonsense also, I know that you were cast in Nonsense and you've yes. done it like 35,000 times. I forgot times. about yeah. Nonsense, yeah. yes, 35,000 so, times. Yeah, yeah, I just wondered, how did that first start and, and then where did you do it? I did actually the dirty version. Repeat the question. Oh, repeat the question is Nonsense. How did that first start with me doing it? And it was originally a show that was a little dirty in a cabaret. It was two, two priests and two nuns. And had a lot of dirty n nun jokes in it. And then, <laughs> and then the, the writer decided that he could make a musical out of it, and which he did. And of course, cleaned it up and made it just funny and not, you know, dirty. Um, I liked the dirty version; it was pretty funny. <laughs> but and and so I knew him because I'd done the other. So then I started doing it, and I and I love doing that show. I could do that show till I was ninety yeah. because it's just a lot of fun. It's not hard. And I, I wish I, I'd love to do it here somewhere because that would be that would be a lot of fun. You did do it here. Remember? Did I do it here? Well, I did it at the Waldo Astoria, but that's been like 85 years ago. All right. So, sorry that I thought. Thank you. Were here. Thank you. Sandal Bergman. Mary Pat, because we have a lot of similar stories, and we just found out we live probably five minutes away from, from each time. other. <laughs> so we have different careers, but but very similar careers, working for a lot of the same. No one back here can hear anything. Oh gosh. Okay, I'll try to talk to my diaphragm. Sorry. I thought I was talking about Okay. <laughs> it's a dance step. Just give me a... Hey! Give me a prop and I'm good to go. Um, I'm so humbled to be here. I first want to say that. You know, I... Kansas City... I was fortunate enough to go, which I don't know very many people that got to go from grade school mm -hmm. to junior high to high school. And when I was in high school, my parents, we moved out of the district. And it was very important to my dad, especially, that I continue to go to school with all of you guys that I grew up with. So I'm really grateful for them. I think they had to pay a little extra, <laughs> you know, but um, I was grateful that for that. To me too. Pardon me? That happened to me too. Several of us had to yeah, and I'm really grateful for that because it made a huge difference. And I want to say me going out, as you guys all know, I pick show business. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's a hard road, like Mary Pat said. A lot of wins and a lot more no's than a lot of yeses. And I always felt that Kansas City grounded me, my upbringing. When I was in trouble or feeling weird or going through a hard time, um, 
Kansas City always how I was brought up and who I knew always kind of grounded me. And I've always been really grateful for that. And um, it was funny, I had great teachers, I had great friends, but my high school experience was very different than most of you. Um, I worked a lot at Starlight Theater. I joined the union because to work, you have to be a member of the union like equity in the theater, Screen Actors Guild to do television or uh, film. I got my union card at 14. So I started working at Starlight Theater. I would go to high school and be with my kids and my friends, and then I was thrown into the adult community of the professional community. And then I would go back to high school and be with people my own age. Then the next, then that summer, I was thrown into the adult world again. So it was a very, <laughs> it was a very different experience. So at the end, when all you guys are taking tests to go to college, school was very important to my dad. And so what are you gonna do? And I said, Dad, I don't wanna go to college. I've already been to college, working at Starlight Theater. And, <laughs> Uh, my parents were very supportive, like Mary Pat's. What do you want to do? And I'd work with a gentleman who came to Starlight Theater to direct, um, oh God, I forget the name of the show. Anyway, he's a very famous now director choreographer. Tommy Toon is his name. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said to me at the end of the show, well, what are you going to do with yourself, little 17 year old girl? And I said, I don't know, you know college I'm not quite sure and he said this is my card this is my number if you came to Los Angeles you will work so I talked to my mom and dad and they my dad wasn't real happy my mom was a little happier and they said they said okay but we're not getting you an apartment I had to stay at a girl's home which was very famous in LA called the Hollywood Studio Club there was a 10 o'clock curfew you got two meals a day, very much like the rehearsal club in New York. Two meals a day, the bathroom and the shower was down the hall. And I lived there for probably about a year and a half. But it was funny, my dad said, I'm giving you six months and then you gotta come back. <laughs> and probably try to figure out what you're gonna do, go to school. I was there two days and I got a job. I was hired to do the Dean Martin show. So I called my dad, I said, Dad, I'm not coming home, but it was a different union and I needed money to join the television union. So, and that's how it continued for me a little bit. And um, so I did a lot of television variety shows, Laugh-In, Dean Martin Show, a lot of... Um, a lot of all the music award shows. Um, and then um, it was interesting because um, I auditioned for uh, a Broadway show called Gigi that was with Agnes Moorhead. Do you remember Bewitch? And that took me to New York. So I was in Los Angeles, 17 to 20. I went to New York with a show and I turned 21. And uh, the show didn't last that long on Broadway. It was about, mm, I don't know, three months. But I stayed, I stayed almost 10 years. So, and I never, I was so fortunate. I was one of those people, I don't know how it happened. Again, you know, luck being in the right place at the right time. I was fortunate enough never to have to have any other job my whole career other than what I do. And so to this day at 68, I'm fortunate enough to collect my Screen Actors Guild pension, <laughs> and my equity, equity pension, pension, and my social, social security. security. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was uh, a real interesting experience. So I, I uh, and it was great. I mean, in New York, you get two weeks off a year in a show. You can take a week or a week. You work every holiday. I never was at a job. I gave my notice to one in rehearsing during the daytime for the other one. Wow. So Talk I about the shows you did because she's been in amazing shows. Yeah, I did um, 
Gigi. I did uh, uh, Coco with Katherine Hepburn. I was on tour with her, and this was an interesting story. She was one of my mentors. There were six of us main girls in the show, and every city we were in, she used to say, girls, it's all right to be beautiful, but you must be educated. And she would get the six of us together with her personal secretary, and every city we were in, we would go to museums. We would go educate ourselves, and I'm very grateful for that. And at the end of the tour, she drew me, she drew us six girls, a caricature of herself, each one was different. And on mine, she wrote, you are as beautiful inside as you are out. Wow. And I, and I was 18, so that, that Did means. Did she know you, really know you? Because. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a very, very fun memory for me. And um, then, of course, my other mentor, which a lot of you know, was uh, Bob Fosse. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I did two Broadway shows for him in the movie All That Jazz. And I worked for some wonderful people, but there's certain teachers in your life that you learn, like Mary Pat was saying from Hal and um, Sondheim. I did Follies for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he was amazing. Um, so I lost my train of thought. What was that? Bob was oh, oh yeah. So Bob was my uh, Bob was my other mentor, and um, I was doing Gigi, and it closed, and it was a one-on-one -on -one audition with him, and um, went to the theater, auditioned him and his assistant, and got the job, and that was Pippin on Broadway. So. I did Mac and Mabel with Bernadette Peters and uh, Robert Preston, which was an amazing experience. I, of course, did Pippin with Cheetah Rivera, Ben Vereen, all those people. I did Chorus Line. I was a first replacement in 1976. And it was amazing to be in New York when you're in a hit Broadway show, it's a carte blanche. Every restaurant you can go into is you know, quite amazing. And because you're in a hit show and it's like, oh, Studio 54. Oh, sure. Everybody's standing out line waiting to get in. But you're in a hit show and it's like, oh, Sandal, come on in. <laughs> you know? And it was fun, you know, to watch all, all those people dancing and all of that. But anyway, I, um, I left New York um, with a touring company and it was Fosse's Dancing. And I wanted to leave New York for a little while. One of the reasons why, there was a plant that I always tried to grow. Now, in New York, there's no light. <laughs> and then I'd buy another plant, and it was like, eh. it would, and I was starting to feel like that plant. You know, I felt like, mm. I just, so I wanted to make a change. And I said, I'm going to do this show on tour. I want it to end in L.A. I'm going to take a break, and then I'll go back to New York. Well, I've changed. All that jazz came out, huge success. Um, I got a movie, Xanadu, with Olivia Newton-John that I worked on for six months. During that time, in New York, I had an apartment that I subletted and because I couldn't go back. And uh, the owner of the building found out I was subletting and evicted me. <laughs> so, so I called my friends and said, I can't come back, I'm doing a movie, and just pack my clothes, whatever's in my apartment, take. And, um, and I was homeless, so when the movie was over, I had nowhere to go. So I said, well, I guess I'll stay in LA. And that's how I ended up in LA, because I probably would have gone back to New York. Because like Mary Pat, honestly, guys, theater is my part. I, you know, Money-wise, television and film are fantastic, but I never enjoyed waking up at f five in the morning, sitting in a trailer, waiting for your scene. Mm -hmm. I want to go into the theater, do my show, have that immediate response, go eat dinner and go home. <laughs> so I liked it, you know, I liked it so very much better. And um, the other thing I want to say real quick is another mentor I had, which was Tommy Toon, I was at the famous uh, Joe Allen's restaurant in New York, 
which Mary Pat knows. And I was with Tommy and he pulls out this napkin and he draws a triangle on the napkin. And in one corner, he writes the word preparation. In the other corner, he writes the word opportunity. And at the top of the triangle, he writes success with a little star that says luck. And I said, Tommy, what does that mean? He said, well, you can be prepared and not have the opportunity and there's no success. You can have the opportunity and not be prepared and there's no success. And then there's always that little asteroid. <coughs> Luck means being in the right place at the right time. And that was a lot of my career. I, I was fortunate enough that sometimes, like I was out here in LA on tour and then that's how Conan came up. And the director saw all that jazz and went, who's that girl? I wanna meet that girl. And I went and met him, never screen tested for it, walked out four hours later and had the job. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, and that was a whole experience with Arnold. That's a whole... I had to keep my mouth shut for years. What, what was that? Well, because I knew a lot of the stuff that was going on with everything. And he was a... Pardon me? Who wants to live forever? <laughs> I don't know if I do. I know that's a famous line. Because people, when I, in an airport, people would come up to me, and, and Doug had said that, would come up and go, do you want to live forever? And Doug, would, my husband would go, what are they saying? <laughs> and I said, it's a line I said in a film that just really took off. Yeah. Like, make that, make my day. Yeah. You know, all these certain, yeah. you know. I have, same, I have the same thing with uh, uh, my best friend's wedding in which I said one word, yes. and the word was tramp. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I am constantly having people walk up and they, they're looking, you know how they look at you, yeah, like yeah. I think it's her, I'm not sure, and then they go, tramp. <laughs> so most of the time I go like, how dare you? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I said, no, no, it's okay. I, I know what you're doing. <laughs> it's fun. It I mean, is so that, funny. That's, that's a fun part of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it yeah. was fun, but he used to die. I go, why do they say that to you all the time? <laughs> um, so I do have one funny, and I probably shouldn't tell this tell story, it, but I'm going to tell the Arnold story because it's funny. <laughs> when we were, and because you know everybody that knows him knows he has a great sense of humor. So after shooting one night, we decided to go to this restaurant. We shot Conan in Spain. I lived there for six months, and I go to this restaurant, and Arnold always had his cronies with him. So come on, Sam, we'll come with us and let's go to this restaurant. So we ate, and it was quite lovely. And I got up, I had, so oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom before we head home. I walk back out and at the table, it's four guys and Arnold. And there were cloth napkins and they made, excuse my French, penises <laughs> out of the napkins. And so on the table were these cloth penises. <laughs> I walked back in and I and this was a beautiful restaurant. I said, I am never going out with you. <laughs> Ever. It was so embarrassing. And uh, that's just him. Tramp. Okay. <laughs> We will never forget that. All right. Wow. Wow. Hey, Bob, can you do that, sit in the chair and do that thing with your legs like Sam? I was her mentor. I taught her that. Miller, Marley, and Mendelssohn. That was it. Ah, Cliff, good luck. Please speak loud like you're angry. Cliff Illig. Well, I guess there's several things that occur to me. Um, one is that we've got uh, two roses between two, two thorns. Which <laughs> <I do>. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. 
And then the other one of the, the other thing that occurs to me at least is that I'm the only guy that stayed here. <laughs> And, um, you know, John went away to University Park, uh, L.A., New York, all those great places, and uh, I stayed here. So, um, it's been a ride, uh, and I don't, I don't know quite how to, how to go about this, but I want to um, make sure that you all understand I have zero talent. <laughs> John's a musician, and you've seen this talent uh, on display here, so uh, I can't possibly be as entertaining as, as they were. But I've got a little bit of a story to tell, um, and it started right here uh, with this group um, in 1960. John and I were talking last night. We couldn't figure, we couldn't remember for sure, he may be more right than I am, that the first computer class in the Shawnee Mission High School District was here in 1967 or 1968. Really? The fall of 1967 wow. or 68. And I tell that story around town now and everybody says, really? You know, <laughs> the first computer class? <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and John and I actually were exchanging uh, descriptions of the computer that we got the chance to use in 1968. It was an IBM 1620. It didn't have any disk space in it, very little memory, and a bunch of cards. <laughs> but I got a, I, I, I had the opportunity, I mean, I actually fell in love with computers. And I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a geek. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't like computers just because they're computers. I like computers because of what they can do. And I got a, uh, a little bit of a, a taste of that um, for my dad uh, before I got out of high school, and then certainly a little bit of it here at high school. And I went over to Lawrence, went to KU, yeah. <laughs> um, with one intention, and that was to get out as quickly as I could. So I've forgotten what day of the week we graduated on here, but it was the very next week that I was over in Lawrence going to summer school. And uh, I spent, uh, I went to summer school every summer. I took heavy loads. And I basically was able to graduate uh, in three years uh, with an accounting degree from the school of business, accounting, and I guess it was a double major with business as well. Uh, but again, my intent was to get out. I spent a semester, a late semester, 19, late 1972, just looking for a job, kind of doing the interview thing and all that. And I ended up uh, accepting a position with the old Arthur Anderson, Not doesn't exist anymore, anybody that remembers Enron. Um, <laughs> but I went to work for Anderson because it was the only accounting firm. I had, again, I had the degree, I'd done well in school, and they really wanted me to come to work for, for a number of firms did, but Anderson was the only firm that would let me start in the computer group, okay? And so I became a, uh, 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 a computer consultant. I started in late 1972, uh, December 1972, and the week after I started, another guy started from Oklahoma State, MBA from Oklahoma State. His Neil, name was Neil Patterson, and uh, Neil and I started a relationship uh, that lasted from early 1973 until his passing in in uh, or July of, of 2017, two years ago. So um, we got to, we had an interesting career at Anderson. We were there for six years. We got to watch the birth of the software industry. When we first started, there was no software. Everything we did, we designed it from scratch. We worked with really complex businesses. We went in and solved really big problems that the businesses had using computers. But we got to, we got to design it from scratch. And then we got to write the code. I actually was a pretty good programmer back in the day. And so having watched the software industry, we got a little impatient with the pace of things at Anderson after five or six years. We started talking about what we would do if we weren't doing what we were doing at Anderson. And we um, decided, and many of you here in town, how many people are not from here, don't live here now? So there's a bunch of you that may not. Most. <laughs> yeah. may not know the story, but um, it actually goes like this, that uh, in the spring of 1979, Neil and another guy, Paul, pa uh, Paul Gorp and I, decided to go out to Loose Park on Sundays and write a business plan for a software company. 
And so this was before laptops and computers and stuff, so we couldn't spread out and do all that stuff. We did it all on, we actually ripped off a bunch of yellow spreadsheets from Arthur Anderson <laughs> and wrote a business plan on 14 column spreadsheets. We actually still have that. They are all watermarked Arthur Anderson. And, <laughs> but we were, we, one of the things we'd learned to be over at our time at Anderson was we learned to be analysts. And analysts just kind of tear things apart. We break things down. We study them. We try to we look at what the, the the we parse through the factors. We come up with some ideas. We test a few things and then see what works. Well, when we were doing our business plan, we made a bunch of lists. Analysts do a lot of lists. One of the lists we made was what are the industries we knew something about from our time at Anderson. What were the industries we didn't know anything about? Healthcare was on the second list. <laughs> Okay, we knew about, we, we spent a lot of time in manufacturing, trucking, uh, public utilities, distribution, a bunch of different industries, fairly complex industries, where we got to use computers to solve big problems. But we walked away from Anderson in, se in September of 1979, just quit. We were all kind of fast track people and they were a little surprised that we'd do that. Uh, and, and throughout our shingle, uh, we didn't know what we were going to do, we didn't have an industry. We just wanted to start a software company, and for the meantime, we were to keep doing what we were doing, which was consulting. So we did that for a while in late 1979 and 1980. It was very serendipitous, and I thought the other theme that came through um, all of these uh, descriptions was what luck means to us all. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable how lucky I've been. Okay, but um, and just from a, um, a luck standpoint, uh, somebody, we had a guy that we'd spent some time with at Anderson that had a client, a doctor client, that had a lab that couldn't collect its bills. He called Neil and said, Neil, come look at this, see if you can fix it. Neil went over and fixed it in about a day. And, um, and then the, the, the docs at that lab dragged us into looking at their laboratory information system, the th system that uses, that does all the, manages all the instruments and pulls all the, uh, the lab results together and sends them to the, to the doc on a chart. And uh, after Neil's had done such a great job of fixing their business issues, they asked him to look at the labs, their labs, and he said, absolutely not. Not going to touch it. But one of the docs left, went down to Tulsa uh, to a big hospital down there, called Neil and said, look, one of the things my deals with the hospitals, they'll let, they'll let me buy any lab information system in, on the planet because they want me to start a business of laboratory at this hospital. Neil, would you go look around the country at the systems that are out there and help me pick the best one? So he spent a couple of months traveling with Terry. <laughs> Terry Dolan was the guy's name. Um, and, and, and as it turned out, uh, Neil said, look, this stuff is crap. The stuff that's out there, they're charging so much for it and it does so little. And so he actually, with, you know, we put together a proposal, went to a, the board of that hospital. The board of that hospital was a bunch of Fortune 500 executives and things. And we said, we said, we'd like to actually propose that we write one from scratch. And they took the deal. <laughs> okay, they, and they agreed they'd pay us whatever one of them normally would cost, and they never asked for rights to own the software or any part of the software. We turned that system on, and uh, we started, we did the design from 1980 to the summer of 1982. We turned it on in August 1982. I spent a lot of time, Neil actually slept in the, um, in the, uh, uh, autopsy table because <laughs> when you're turning these systems on you, 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 it's hard and heck to figure out whether they're working or not so you just got to be there with them constantly so we did that um, ended up putting our company together really around that notion uh, we did the venture capital thing in 1983 not really because we needed the money, but because we needed the the the, the notoriety or the, the the credibility that went with having done that, um, we from during the 1980s we basically ran the gauntlet of being a uh, a little um, very challenged micro startup. To um, by 1986, we we're doing well. We we're making money. We went public in December of 1986. If you had put $10,000 into that public offering in December 1986, you'd have $2 million now. Wow. Thanks for telling us now. Yeah. <laughs> that house in the house in Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> so during the 80s, we grew the company. Uh, you know, I'm fundamentally, you know, yeah, yeah, I, I'm not a bad technical guy, uh, but I'm fund fundamentally a business operations person. Uh, the key when you're in a business like that is you got you got to go sell stuff. You got to make what you're doing attractive to, to customers. You've got to create value for them so that they'll reward you with buying what you're, what you're trying to do. And then we had to build organization around that. We had to support, healthcare's a tough place. We had to support all those systems that were out there. Um, you know, Neil always has said that uh, we live at the intersection, Cerner lives at the intersection of IT and healthcare every day. Pick two industries that are bigger, pick two industries that are changing faster than healthcare. And we lived at the, at the epicenter of, of that for a lot of years. Uh, they, during the 80s, we grew the company, did well, made a lot of money from 1994, or 1990 to 1994. We were probably third or fourth uh, company in the economy in terms of returning, uh, generating a return to shareholders. Um, we, uh, during, let's say at the end of 19, or 1989, we had like 360 people in the company. Uh, at the end of 19, or 1999, we had about 800. At the end of 2010, we had 2,600. And at uh, 2019, we now have 30,000. <laughs> and then there's there's um, uh, fourteen thousand of those are here in Kansas City. Okay, and you may have noticed those of you driven around may have noticed one of our four big campuses. We got a half a dozen other smaller things around town, about five million square feet of office space here in the in the Kansas City area. We're doing a tremendous uh, amount of of new software development things here. Uh, we do business in 30 countries around the world. Uh, revenues this year for Cerner will be, I say, keep saying we, I gotta be a little careful because I retired from the board in January. So the, the we is a uh, imperial we, I guess. So, but we, um, we really have a, a um, you know, Cerner's still got a tremendous amount of upside. Um, you know, the, the valuation of the company is over $20 billion. There's hundreds and hundreds of associates, families, and investors here in Kansas City that have done very well because of what's gone on at Cerner. And fundamentally, it's just a great, great success story that goes with a great, great city and a great place to grow a company. Now, if I may, let me touch on um, another aspect of who I am. You got one minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's he's going to bully me. He's going to shoot me unless you tell him not tell him not to. That was our conversation. He recommended that I shoot. I said I'd rather bully. <laughs> but with Mary Pat's advice, never mind. <laughs> so you guys can throw me off if you want to. Let me touch on another part of the story, and that's the Sporting Kansas City part of the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, in 2006, Lamar Hunt, who I consider to be one of the greatest entrepreneurs in, in, in sports history, um, Kansas City Chiefs and all that, bunch of other stuff, uh, the USTA, I mean, just a ton of stuff that Lamar was involved in. He called Neil and I and said, I'd like to chat with you about soccer. And Neil said, well, Cliff, Lamar wants to talk to us about soccer. What do you think? I said, if Lamar wants to talk, we're going to talk to him. So we had dinner down at the Capitol Grill. Lamar made four points. First point he made is, Soccer is the world's game, yeah. okay? Even out here in the flatlands in the middle of the country, we're becoming much more global in our orientation. Number two, there are 110,000 kids in the Kansas City region that plays soccer. And the way Lamar Hunt thought, those are all future season ticket holders. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way what Lamar was, uh, was, was wired. Uh, Lamar made the point that Kansas City needs soccer. He made the point that uh, Kansas City is a major league city in the minds of most of the rest of the country. We're the 32nd biggest city in the country if you look at the DMAs. Um, and we're the, the, uh, as 
uh, he, he made the point we're Major League City because of our Major League Sports franchises when you're viewed by the rest of the country. If we lose one of those, we become less Major League. So he said, Neil, Cliff, I'd like for you to buy the Wizards. At the time, it was the Kansas City Wizards. And Neil and I walked out of the Capitol Grill, and Neil looked at me and said, are we going to do this? I said, yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 was, it was not inexpensive, but Lamar agreed to work with us. So we went through, we committed to Lamar at the time that we'd build a soccer-specific stadium here in Kansas City. Uh, we committed to him uh, at the time that we would uh, keep the team here, because that was the threat, is that if he hadn't found an owner, it was going to have to move. And so I think most of you, at least from here, know the story. We built the, what now is Children's Mercy Park out by the Speedway. It's, a, it's, <laughs> now, it's now recognized as probably the best soccer-specific building in the Western Hemisphere. It's small, but it's very good. The league now sends Major League Soccer, I'm a bunch of, I'm a bunch of the league committees, Major League Soccer sends all the new prospective owners, there are now 27 teams, in the in the in the league they send all of the prospective owners to kansas city under the heading that kansas city is our model franchise wow. and not only because of the building but the huge focus that we have on the fan experience anybody that's been there i think knows what i'm talking about <laughs> are you working for him yeah <laughs> he is he is so anyway um we did uh, we 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 uh, ran a great. Um, it's been a great journey. We've done a lot of different things. Um, <laughs> so uh, let me let me land there and just say uh, that uh, Kansas City, although New York's great, LA is great, <laughs> University Park is probably great. <laughs> so. Uh, I've enjoyed being here. I think Kansas City is a great place to live. It's a great place to grow a company. It's a great place to grow a family. Um, and uh, we've done our small part to uh, employ about 14,000 of, of, of Kansas City. So thanks for your time. Is that worth it? Yeah. 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 Good idea. yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Uh, it was a group effort. Uh, uh, thank you to each one of you. This was terrific. Yeah. And are you encouraged to go mentor, to go look for luck and opportunities <laughs> and preparation? And, and look, mentees, it is a great word. Mentees are out there desperate for who we are and what we've got to give them uh, not just our children or grandchildren or if i never had them i could you've got people around you who need what you have so this is a great time to reflect a great time to remind ourselves not just of these four who are no notorious, notorious. <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> but after the shoot, they got up. They did. Yeah. yeah. Now this has been great. I appreciate these four. Um, now we're going to be done. We're done. Um, there's some nibblies still available, and I don't know if the school will want us to put this room back together. They do. No. I would. Oh, Photo. don't worry. There will be plenty of those. <laughs> yeah, don't you guys leave. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bob. So make sure you turn in your assignments by three. No, it's fine. <laughs> we'll see you tonight at Milford. Milford. Even your year, but
again at eight You burned your breakfast so far Things are going great Your mother warned you There'd be days like these But she didn't tell you When the world's brought you Down to your knees That I'll be there for you Some of my dear friends have told me year after year and week after week and day after day that I have a keen sense for the obvious. <laughs> one of the things I personally have observed in life is one of the most difficult things of living is having to say goodbye to our family and to our friends. Obviously, it's a part of life. The longer we live, the more family members we have to say goodbye to. Your face reflects all the good inside. You let it right out and talk to me. And did not hide. And it makes me smile just to think what I've got. Cause you're my friend. And a friend cannot be forgotten Cannot be forgotten If everybody in this world Were friends like you and me And we can finally live in peace harmony and it makes me smile just to think what we got cause we are friends and a friend cannot be forgotten and harmony and it makes me smile just to think what we got Cause we are friends And a friend cannot be forgotten 